Hi everyone, I'm Paul Knox Johnson from Haven Knox Johnson, your friendly boat insurance providers, and welcome to the latest webinar in our From the Helm series. To date, we have covered all sorts of varied topics on our webinars, from cruising the north coast of France, sailing around Britain, living on a narrowboat with YouTubers Fran and Rich from Floating Our Boat, all the way through to installing lithium batteries in your boat. You can watch all of them on our YouTube account. With tonight's webinar, we are focusing on helping people through the process of buying a boat. If you're ready to take the plunge but are unsure of the process and the rights and wrongs of buying a boat or upgrading your boat, then this is the webinar for you. We want to give you the knowledge and confidence to get out there and make that purchase and know the process involved. Hopefully this webinar will give you that confidence. We hope to give you the information required to try and make sure the whole boating process is smooth and a pleasurable experience. So without further ado, I'd like to thank our expert panel for joining us and welcome them. I think it's probably better for them to say a few words about themselves before we kick off, starting with Stuart Austin of ProMarine Finance. Good evening, everybody. My name is Stuart Austin from ProMarine Finance, as Paul has introduced me. Uh, ProMarine Finance has been established uh, since 2010. Uh, we launched at Southampton Boat Show. We, we are a non-bank independent uh, boat lender, and we specialise in smaller loans from 10000 to 500,000 with an average of 60,000. Uh, all our team are boat owners. Um, we're all currently sailors, although we do have power boat qualifications. And I can certainly say we've had and enjoyed canal boat holidays. Uh, we provide a bespoke personal service to the boat buyer. And we can finance all types of boats from liverboards, uh, motorboats, non homeowners, new build stage payments. And you will find us at Boat Life, Crick and Southampton boat shows, along with some occasional regional events. And you'll find out more about what we do uh, later during this presentation. Thanks, Paul. And, and now our, our helpful surveyor from our helpful Haven Helpful Hints videos, Ben Sutcliffe-Davis. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, I've obviously been in the industry a bit too long. Uh, started like my father and that, and I've been boat building. I also had a brokerage in the 90s called Anglia Yacht Brokerage, and I've written for several of the leading magazines in the industry, Yachting Monthly, PBO. And um, I mean, I think it's not unfair to say that part of this has been inspired by the Southampton Boat Show, where we've been doing uh, how to buy a boat, and it's been a resounding success. And it, it's great to be able to bring this to a wider audience through Hayden Knox Johnson, uh, especially with the guys like uh, Stuart and Chris who've given up their time as well so great stuff and uh and the broker at the center of it all uh Chris Ibbotson good evening everybody uh so yeah I'm Chris Ibbotson I am currently the group brokerage manager for Boat Point Marinas um so we've got eight uh, brokerage offices around the country um Scotland North Wales and the South um I got into the industry about 25 years ago. Um, I've been brokering ever since, um, also involved in new boat sales. Um, until recently, I was the vice chair of ABIA, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. That's the Association of Brokers and Yachting Agents, um, and we cover contracts and all sorts of bits and pieces. So hopefully, if there's a brokerage question you've got at the end that I can't answer, I'll, I'll know somebody that can. <laughs> Thank you very much, all guys. So basically, we're, we're, we're setting our sort of sights in this webinar on boat purchases, sort of the more normal boat purchases. So sub £350,000 based in the UK, mainly because there's so many complexities when you start looking outside the UK and when you get into the bigger value boats. We, we'll, we're going to try and work our way through the sort of standard boat, boat buying process. So We'll move on to our, the first section of our of, of our um, of our webinar, which is basically explains the key people within the process um, that we're going to be talking about. So, Chris, do you want to talk us through the um, where each one of these fits in? Yeah, well, so I think it's pretty obvious. For my job, I need a buyer and a seller. Um, I believe the first one of those I need is a seller, um, somebody that's got a boat that they are looking to upgrade, change, get out of. Um, and then obviously the job of a broker, think of us like an estate agent is the, probably the, the, the simplest way of doing that. Our job is to put buyers and sellers um, together um, on the most appropriate boat that we can find for the particular buyer. 
Um, in order to do that, I rely on the services of people like Stuart um, to assist the buyers with their finance. And I rely on people like Ben as a surveyor to ensure that the boat that they think they're buying is the right one. Um, so yeah, the broker sits in the middle of essentially all those parties. And for want of a word, we're the juggler. We're the, we're the guys that keep everything sort of moving together. But I need the, uh, the assistance of the other two to ensure that my buyer ends up with a boat bought from my seller. I think that is probably the simplest way of putting it, Paul. I think that's a brilliant way. I, I, lo I love the phrase juggler there. I think that's absolutely the right the, the right phrase to use for, for for a broker. Now you'll see we've we've sort of grayed out the lawyer. What well, we're going to get onto that later because in the sort of transactions we're talking about, we're not sure whether we're we're, we're pretty confident that lawyers don't need to be involved. But we will move on to that that sort of aspect of things later. So we're going to start off by going through the whole process, um, and so. What we'll do is I'll, th these guys can each sort of go in and talk about their part of, of where they fit into the process and how it all how it starts and how it finishes and how we get from just a boat that's for sale to a boat that's owned by somebody else. So over to you guys. Okay, so I, think, I was going to say. So I think I think from everybody's perspective, the first thing that you're going to do as a buyer is start looking. Um, and obviously, the most sensible place these days is the internet. Years ago, when I started, it was copies of PBO and Yachting Monthly that customers would walk into my office with, usually three or four months out of date, looking for an old Moody um, in the back of the yard. These days, the internet is arguably your key source. Um, you type in there the name and make and model of a boat, something is going to pop up, and inevitably it will be one of the major search engines, the likes of Yacht Market, Right Boat, or Yacht World, and that will start driving the responses to your requirements. No difference to buying a house or a car. You set your parameters and the, the various websites will provide answers for you. Now, it may be, depending on the stage that you're at, you may or may not have heard of half the boats that you're looking at. Um, and that, again, is where a broker will step in and start assisting. Just be careful on the internet. There are, like everything, dubious websites out there. We often get inquiries for boats that sold six, 12 months ago. Um, there's a particular website that ends in .ru. If you find a boat on there, ignore it. It is a Russian fake website. Um, so just be a little bit cautious before you start traveling around the country. Make sure you phone the supposed broker um, that has the adverts uh, online. Give them a call um, because at that point in time, at least you know the boat exists. Um, so that's how you're going to start searching for the boat. I guess the key point is, can you afford the boat? And that's where arguably you need to start talking to people like Stuart. Okay, so our role in providing finance for boats, um, we're, our position I think has changed in this flow chart since 2017. And now most buyers that we talk to are coming to us having done the internet search that Chris is talking about and finding an idea of the boats, whether it be the, the portals that Chris mentioned or some of the portals that might refer more to inland boats. Um, and that's where people are looking to see whether their finance and what finance is available at a much earlier stage in the buying process. And that I think is positive for a number of reasons in that immediately the buyer becomes clear on what is affordable to them, but it also gives a very clear message to the vendor and the broker that they are a credible, serious buyer in the marketplace who is able to complete quickly. And given the speed that boats have been changing hands in the last few years, being in that position um, I would argue is being is better than being a cash buyer. Um, when we provide finance approvals to customers, uh, then the conditions that we will always add, unless it's a new boat, is that the boat must have a satisfactory pre-purchase survey in the buyer's name, and that the boat almost sorry will always require to have a satisfactory title chain of paperwork. And that's something that Chris will talk about shortly. Um, 
Some of these conditions have been known to put off sellers and brokers, but that's a question you should ask why. Uh, if a, a broker or a seller is nervous about a buyer coming to them with finance approved with conditions of satisfactory title that the person selling the boat is legitimately doing so and that the boat is as purported to be, uh, those are all positive things for you to know. Um, and kind of timescales that we turn transactions around in is normally within 24 hours. And you'll hear more from me later, I hope. That's quite an impressive turnaround. So once, once the finance is kind of there and you've had your first conversation, that's sort of working its way through the process. The next the next stage, Chris, obviously pick up the phone, go in and see or... Talk to your broker, yeah. So look, there's, arguably there's two reasons for talking to your broker. One, you know exactly what it is you want. A Moody, a Bavaria, a Sea Lion, you name it. You've made your decision that you want that particular type of boat. So the reason for talking to your broker is twofold. One, as we've just discussed, there's a lot of fake adverts out there, a lot of boats that are left on websites that may have sold. If you pick up the phone and call me about a specific boat, I can talk to you about that specific boat. It is for sale. It is in this condition. It's on the hard standing. It's in the water. And we can talk you through that. The other reason, of course, for talking to a broker is that you may be not sure what type of boat it is you want. You've spoken to Stuart. You've been approved for finance. You've got £50,000 burning a hole in your back pocket and you'd like to get on the water. Depending on the stage of your boating life that you're at, you might have had previous boats and be looking for a bit of guidance as to what's a suitable alternative. Or if it's your first boat, a broker, particularly if they've been around for a while, should be able to point you potentially in the direction of other makes and models that you may not have heard of. They will have had experience with the surveyors to know which boats are arguably a little bit better built, that are more rugged, are better suited for certain conditions. And so you've got all of that experience that the broker holds in his noggin that will help you to narrow that search down. Um, and yeah, that's that's fundamentally the point of talking to me first. I don't like people traveling halfway across the country, turning up on my doorstep, and then they're disappointed when they see the state of the boat they're coming to have a look at. If you phone me beforehand, I'll be honest. If I've got a boat in the bottom of the yard that's been sitting under the trees for 12 months because the owner hasn't been down to it, I want you to be aware of the condition before you come to see it. I don't want you to be disappointed. Equally, there are people out there looking for project boats, and that could be a perfect conversation to have with somebody like that. So that's, yeah, have the chat with the broker first before you travel too far, really and fundamentally to avoid disappointment. And let's not forget, boats do go out. Um, quite often, we'll wander down to the marina um, to go and have a look for a boat, only to find out that the owners decided to take it out for the day, forgot to tell us, um so yeah double double check every time and, and what sort of things should they be doing talking to you about other than once once they've done the viewing they've found an interest in a boat where what what's the next sort of where do they go next or what do they do next so, yeah so again that so you, you, we were chatting about a particular boat um i've convinced you it's worth coming to have a look at either because it's the right price the right type the right condition um the next thing you need to be asking anybody that's selling a boat, and that doesn't matter whether it's me, the broker, or more importantly, a private individuals, is, as we've got there in the top right-hand corner of this screen, clarifying clear title. Um, I've been doing this job now for 25 years, and we quite often have to turn boats away that vendors bring to us to sell because they don't have the correct paperwork for the boat. We're all used to buying and selling cars, and that's ever so simple. You have a single V5 document. One person sells it, signs it, hands it over. Somebody in Wales in a government office does the rest. Boats are different. Every boat that we sell should have a set of clear title paperwork. Um, it's really important you try and establish this either before seeing the boat or at the point of viewing it. Um, broker like myself, I will sit down and do all of the due diligence with my vendor before we even advertise the boat. So any of the boats that you find of mine, for example, that are up on the internet, I will have clarified that we've got five years clear title, and I'll explain that in a minute. I will clarify the VAT status of the boat, something that's changed significantly since Brexit. Um, and I'll clarify something called RCD, which is the Recreational Craft Directive. And that's arguably one of the most important ones because it does have legal consequences. So imagine if you will, I don't know, a little boat that's been advertised on eBay, 
Mr. Smith's selling it cheap. You turn up, you buy it, you hand over your £15,000. He gives you a bit of paper and a receipt that says, thank you very much for buying the boat. And you go off and enjoy the next three or four years floating around the Solent or wherever it is you're doing your boating. And a couple of years later, you bring it into my office. Um, and you say, look, I bought this boat a few years ago. It was on eBay. It was on Marketplace. It was on somewhere. And I'd like you to sell it, Chris. I have responsibilities. I work on behalf of the vendor to sell his boat. But ultimately, I'm really acting on behalf of the buyer because the vendor's not going to come and moan at me in three years' time that he he hasn't had his money. He will have been paid on the day. But it's certainly possible that a buyer um, of a boat could walk into my office in three years' time complaining that they weren't given the correct paperwork. Five years clear title. Let's get that one out of the way. Simply put, if you want to register a boat in the UK, you need to have five years clear title. It's a requirement of the MCA. It's also, there are sort of legal statutes, for example. If somebody walked into my office tomorrow, presented me with a bill of sale that said they bought the boat in 2022. So I know that it's been owned by them for two years. How do I know who they bought it off prior to that? Did they buy it off Mr. and Mrs. Smith? Did they buy it off a deceased member of the family? I've got to be able to establish where that boat has been for five years in terms of its ownership. Um, and every boat should have title paperwork, really going back to year dot when it was first bought. Um, the second most important thing is probably the VAT. That's the one we get asked the most questions about. Is this boat that I'm about to buy a VAT paid boat? There's really only one way of saying yes for certain, and that's with the original VAT invoice for the boat from an original dealer to the first owner, and then being able to trace the ownership from that first owner to the current day. There are occasions when original invoices have gone missing um, and the HMRC used to issue some letters um, on a form called a C88, which was essentially a letter to say that UK customs had no interest in the boat. Thirdly, and this has come about as a result directly of Brexit, if your boat was in the UK on the 31st of December 2020, HMRC will consider that boat to have UK VAT status. Doesn't necessarily mean it's VAT paid, but it means that it falls under UK VAT law. Um, and I'm quite happy to answer questions on this at the end, otherwise you'll all get bored of me waffling. So we have to try and establish the VAT status of a boat before we list it. And the third one, the most important one, I guess, is the RCD, Recreational Craft Directive. Any boat that was built or imported into Europe since 1998 has to have RCD certification. It has to conform to European build requirements. So if you turn up in my office, having bought a lovely island packet in America last week, and you've brought it into the UK, you bring it into my office to sell, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, did you pay your VAT? So when you import that boat from the States, you pay your VAT. You can use that boat as your own private boat, arguably for as long as you want. But the minute you put it up for sale for the first time in the UK, or if you're in Europe, it has to comply to European and UK um, legislation. So you have to have a post-construction certificate issued. It's expensive, but I cannot legally sell your boat without an RCD uh, document. So we lose a lot of listings. It used to be a case of all the old bay liners and little American sports boats being put into 40-foot uh, containers, shipped over, used along the south coast, brought into our office, but with no compliance paperwork. Without that, I can't sell it. More importantly, without that, you can't sell it. So if you go and stick that little boat that doesn't have RCD paperwork on eBay and somebody buys it and there's an accident, they are coming after you. You are the person that sold that boat. So it's really, really important that you, you check that out beforehand. And that's what a broker does. Before a boat goes onto my books, I probably spend two or three days clarifying all the paperwork to make sure that when you walk into my office to buy it, it's got clear title, it's got VAT status, and it's got its RCD. And the risk of buying a boat privately, for example, is that if you haven't spoken to a broker about it, the owner gives you a whole load of paperwork, it looks legit, but is it? Thanks, Chris. Um, so, so you found your boat, you, they've come to you, you've got the title paperwork in place. The next stage is, you know, you've got the asking price. What's the, the next stage is making an offer, I suppose. So 
What the, yeah, the, so the, you, you, you've spent a few days, a few weeks, and in some cases a few years, uh, wandering up and down the coast of the UK looking for the perfect boat. It's taken you four years. You've realised the perfect boat doesn't exist, but that one in the corner of the boatyard over there, it'll do. It'll get you by until you decide what, uh, what you want to do. So you've seen it, you've viewed it, you've chatted to the broker about the price. It's not my boat. You can be as rude as you like about it. You can make the most ridiculously cheeky offer on that boat that you feel is necessary. And my job is to convey that to the vendor in such a way that we hopefully convince them to accept it. Sometimes the offers are so low that we can't bridge the gap. But more often than not, if I've got a, a willing buyer and a willing seller, there may be a bit of a uh, sort of horse wrangling, but we get there in the end. Your offer that you make, the broker will ask you to clarify what it is subject to. Do you need a survey? Do you need a sea trial? Do you need me to paint it pink before you'll uh, you'll take the boat away? Whatever your offer is, we'll get it in writing for you from you. We'll convey it to the vendor. And once we've got an acceptance, then we'll send out our um, sale and purchase agreement. As I mentioned earlier, I'm, um, I'm a member of an association called ABIA. Um, so we have sale and purchase agreements that have been drawn up by LA Marine. They are designed to protect both the buyer and the seller. So if you're buying a boat privately and you pay the guy a £500 deposit, and for whatever reason he decides to change his mind and, and just not sell you the boat, you don't legally have any recourse on having that £500 back. He could claim that it was a gift. If you're doing it through a brokerage and they have a sensible, um, well-worded contract, it will protect you, the buyer, because it will set out the parameters of you surveying it and sea trialing it. But it will also offer protections to the vendor. We'll put some timescales in there with, that we'd like all parties to adhere to. Um, we recently had one uh, complication where the broker, not one of mine, fortunately, had said that the completion of the boat sale would occur on the day that the house sale went through. House sale fell out of bed. We have then got an open-ended contract because the buyer was still willing to buy the boat. It just meant he had to put his house back on the market. And of course, the vendor's jumping up and down saying, I wanted it sold much sooner. So the offer that you make, you tell me what your conditions are. We convey that to the vendor. We put that in a watertight contract to protect all parties. At which point, we pass you over to Ben, or an equivalent, to have the boat surveyed to make sure that that offer that you've made of £100,000 is actually worth it. Ben's there to make sure that you're not buying a pup. Ben. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we're going to cover a lot more of this further down in the presentation, but I think the important thing is when, no matter where you are in this process, talking to a surveyor, uh, before you even go and look at a boat, sometimes can be quite a good move um, because we have we've seen all the types of boats. And you say you're going to go transatlantic, and then you're telling me you're thinking about buying a little prelude or something. Then then it's pretty obvious it's not a good plan. Um, also, when you're looking around with boats, um, using yacht clubs and sailing clubs is always a good good starting point as well. But I think the value in a broker is amazingly good, and it's really important that you talk to them correctly now a lot of brokers have uh local surveyors on their listings and so when you go in to see people like chris they can quite often uh, give you listings of uh, local surveyors normally they should be a member of um either the ydsa or iims which are both uh, uk based surveying groups there's also scms as well here in the uk um so there's lots of different ways of uh, looking at the qualities and qual um, qualifications of surveyor uh, i actually uh Say good evening to anyone at Falmouth. Uh, I was down, down in Darthaven yesterday and they, they were all gobsmacked at the fact that actually there is no qualification in the UK required for, for a surveyor. But we'll we'll go down that line later. But um, it is really important to make sure that the person you have looking at your boat has hopefully got the correct professional indemnity, is a member of an association. And if you're never sure, not too sure, you can always ask um, to see a copy of a, a sample survey report, you know. So there's lots of the bits and pieces in there which we'll go into on, on too further. Um, but I think the next post re really is once you've you, you've you've made that offer, the ambitions of when you get the survey is another problem. Uh, quite a lot of us are in, into sort of three three weeks plus. And correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, but some of the survey 
um, requirements from pre-purchasers, 14 days, and uh, depending on the broker's requirements, it can be quite difficult at what I call spring fever time to actually find a surveyor that can actually fill your requirements. Is that about right, Chris? Uh, how's yeah, your contract so work? We, the again, the contract that we put in, so again, going back a slide, when you're making your offer, if you've spoken to your surveyor, so we'll send out an agreement, and typically we'll allow a two-week process um, for that to happen. But again, as Ben mentions, during the springtime, boatyards are busy relaunching boats, surveyors are busy because people are buying boats, um, and it may be that after you've made your initial offer, you phone me up and say, look, Chris, as much as we'd like to do this within two weeks, the yeah. chap I want to use, in this case, Ben, he's on holiday. He's busy, busy, busy. We can't arrange it till that. We have the flexibility then. We have to go back to our vendor, of course, and just make sure that they're still willing to participate in this um, offer. But all we'd be saying to them is that, look, this chap wants to buy your boat. Um, the yard's really busy. The surveyor's really busy. So the earliest we'll be able to get them out is this particular date. And we will amend the uh, the agreement accordingly to give them the time frame um, to get that work done. And and sometimes it's no one's fault, but Mother Nature. Before now, we've had surveys booked in. We've had tremendous gales, or like we've got currently on the inland system, quite uh, high floodwaters. So none of the dry docks are dry. So you can't even put a boat in or move them under some of the bridges. So sometimes the actual, we're all ready, but we can't move a boat to the right place. So there's there's a lot of uh, little dominoes to knock down in on the way. Yeah. The important thing, if you're buying through a broker, is just keep everybody informed. Um, yeah. As long as buyer and seller are all still on the same page. Um, we have situations, of course, where offers go in on the day that the vendors are just about to disappear on holiday for two weeks. Um, so, again, we'll we'll work around that in terms of the timeframes of the contracts. Most of the paperwork can be done electronically these days. It's only really the um, the final bill of sale where we need wet signatures. I'll come on to that later. Um so there's little or no reason that we can't progress a sale. It may be that if you want a part of your offer was, I'd like to do a handover with the vendor as opposed to a broker or an independent skipper. I'd like to meet the actual owner of the boat to get him to talk you through it. Then again, we'll just discuss the timeframes that are convenient for everybody. Then at some point, obviously, you've got to arrange the insurance and all that, bring all that sort of side into yeah. it. Now, typically, uh, there are two types of insurance policy available within the UK. There is um, there's a what is technically called a third party only, which it, which can have a varying amount of cover. So make sure you read the, the cover that your insurance company is offering you. And then there is what is called an all risks policy or on the Haven version, an all weather policy, um, where which is more like a, the equivalent of a fully comp sort of insurance policy there. There is, there is a lot of difference between your standard car insurance and boat insurance because of obviously the, the environments in which they go into. So make sure you speak to an insurance person before you can go online you can buy a policy online and most of them are fine but if you if you have any doubts make sure you speak to your insurance company now regarding the legality of insurance um theoretically uh it, on coastal waters there is no legal requirement to have an insurance policy however um, lots of marinas and lots of harbours and lots of inlets and lots of rivers will have their own bylaws in place, which will state you need to have a minimum third party insurance. The inland waterways, uh, that's a completely different kettle of fish on the basis that in order to get your river license, and I stand to be corrected on this, in order to get your river license, you have to show proof of insurance. And if you don't have a river license, you can't really travel up and down the canals and rivers of the UK. So technically, insurance on the inland waterways is a legal requirement. Um, so insurance can be set up relatively quickly. It can be done uh, with one phone call and you pay at the end of it, or you can do it online, as I say, and you can fill in the forms. If the quotes, ha if you're happy with a the quote, then pay it. Then it's just a question of filling in the details and um, paying at the end. So it's a fairly it's a fairly simple process. Um, so once all this is in place, we we move on to obviously where we complete on the sale, Chris. Yeah. So you you, you found a boat. You made an offer. Um, you had your survey, um, your finance was arranged or put in place in advance of all of this happening. Um, you've spoken to your insurance broker. You're happy that this is the right boat at the right price. You can afford it. You can insure it. Um, so then it's just a case of getting to that completion stage. So this, again, is where as a broker, as opposed to uh, buying privately, 
My job is to sit down with you, the purchaser, and go through the paperwork. We will discuss, We will, you'll have already probably spoken to us about it anyway, but we'll actually sit down and physically go through each of the independent bills of sale, the VAT paperwork, the RCD, so that you have a full sort of comprehensive set of documents for that boat, so that in the event you want to sell it in two, three, four years' time, everything is in place for you. Um, if you're buying a boat, going back a few stages, prior to the survey, you will have signed your agreement and you will have paid a 10% deposit. Um, we will then, on the day or a couple of days before completion, be looking to uh, take the remaining balance. Um, normally you pay 10%, so we'd be asking for the balance of that. As a broker, I want to be in a position where sitting in my office, on one side of the desk or in my grubby left hand, I've got all of the title paperwork for the boat. And on the other side of my desk or in my grubby right hand, I've got all of your money and I will await your permission. So we'll sit down, we'll go through the paperwork. Once you're happy that that paperwork is correct and we've, we've discussed all that, I'll need written confirmation from you that you're prepared for me to release the funds to the vendor. At that point, that's when the transaction completes. You send me a text, you send me an email to confirm that you want me to release it. I pay out to the vendor and that's when we'll hand over the keys, the paperwork, and the boat essentially becomes yours. And that's when I'll be reminding you, have you sorted out your insurance? Now, if you are using Stuart, Stuart will have already clarified with me that we're holding the paperwork. You will have paid a 10% deposit to the broker. You will then be paying your remaining balance of deposit to Stuart. And it'll be Stuart that I'm phoning up for, for the remaining monies. Um, he'll get in touch with me. He'll ask me to send him the title paperwork. You'll be given a set of copies, I think I'm right in saying, Stuart. Um, uh, you, you are right, but the balance of the deposit would be payable to you, not me, yeah. usually. Yeah, so sorry, yeah, we have the 30% and yeah. then or, and then uh, the, the balance comes over. And at that point in time, as I say, we would release the title paperwork to Stuart. He's got an interest in the boat, so he holds the title documents. You eventually, over a few years, um, clear down your uh, your loan, and at which point Stuart will then return all those original documents to you. Right. Um, and then the boat's yours. She's insured. She's been surveyed. Um, and that's when we wish you many, many happy days on the water. Thanks, guys. So that was a really good insight into the whole process. What we're going to try and do is break it down a little bit more in the next slides. Um, Let's go back to where, where where is the sources of people's information, where they can find, where they can look for a boat, where they can do all this sort of stuff. That, Chris. So, yeah, sort of recapping. 25 yeah. years ago, as I say, people would walk into my office furnishing an old copy of PBO that they'd stolen from the dentist. Um, <laughs> and they'd be surprised why the, the boat that they were looking at had sold. And I'd remind them that that advert was sort of three months old and we'd advertised it two months before that. So boat was long gone. But the difference, the, the major difference in buying at the time was that we didn't have Google, we didn't have the internet. So that copy of PBO led you down to a boatyard in the far flung corners of Hampshire or Dorset or wherever. And then at which point I had you in my office and we would actually sell you a boat. We did what brokers used to do. We'd discuss your needs, your requirements, the type of boat you were interested in. And whilst mm. the Moody 31 that you saw in the back of PBO had gone, I would introduce you to a Saddler or a Halberg Rassi or a whatever it was that I felt might match your requirements. And the chances are I'd spend half an hour, 45 minutes with you on a boat that you hadn't initially come to see. And you would tell me what you liked about it, what you didn't like about it. I don't like the headroom. I don't like the aft cabin. I don't like the toilet. Right. So let's forget all of those types of boats and let's concentrate on looking for something else. My job's weirdly got a little bit harder um, yeah. since the arrival of the internet because people come into my office laser focused. They have decided that a Geno 32 point whatever is their chosen boat. And they'll walk in here and it'll be for sale and they'll decide that they don't like it. At which point I will make the suggestion of a Beneteau, a Bavaria, a something that is I feel is similar. And we really do honestly get met with quite a little bit. Oh, no, no, I wouldn't buy one of those. My uncle had one of those. And so that sort of salesmanship that we used to have because the Internet wasn't around has been taken away from us a little bit. But the flip side is it puts you as a buyer in a really strong position. Once you have found the boat of your dreams, the make, the model, 
you can quickly jump on the internet and say, oh, look, there's one for sale in Ipswich. There's one for sale in Bangor. There's one for sale here. You can do a price check without in seconds. You can compare the specification in seconds. If the photographs are up to date and the broker isn't posting you something from 1985 that the owner gave him, in reality, you can assess the condition. So the nice thing for me with the internet has brought about is that when a customer does come into the office, having found a boat, they know that they're looking at the right make, the right model. It's at a price that they can afford. The photographs look nice. So as long as that boat is as they expected it to be in a marina, looking pretty, ready to go, it has sped up the process. I don't tend to get so many people wandering around aimlessly looking at boats. So the role has changed a little bit. You will find, as I say, lots of websites out there. There are three or four major ones in the UK. Um, there are adverts. Um, there's a website, for example, called Apollo Duck, which, again, you'll find lots of private boats on there because um, it's one of the few websites that don't require you to be a broker to advertise on there. Bringing me back full circle. No problem at all buying and selling boats privately. Just make sure that you are doing your due diligence before you start handing over money um, to, to move forward. I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It's, uh, it used to be a Saturday morning sitting in your yacht broker's office watching people walking past. Now it's people coming in, as you say, laser guided. But um, th th thanks. Like that. So, that, so now we've found our boat. We're kind of looking at it. And before we want to spend a lot of time on it, we're going to look at see whether we can afford it. So we're going to find out how, so Stuart, how do we finance a per the purchase? What are the, what are the processes? What are, what, how, how does it all go? So the first thing someone needs to do is to, having found their boat, is probably then try and find uh, sources from where they can uh, top up the funds if they don't have them available, or whether there's a short-term need for financing. Um, so th the internet tends to be the, the, same, the same source of information as where they typically looked for the boat. So the same... Um, search engines will come up with marine finance providers. The boat portals will have this information. Several boat brokers will have links to our uh, finance available um, and also other lenders. But something to be to be mindful of is that um, if you're Googling marine finance, you'll have pages and pages of information. Um, but in reality, there's only four marine lenders in the UK. Uh, three of those are banks and the, the fourth one is ourselves. So a lot of the others are claiming to offer marine finance and many of them are simply personal loans. And the difference between marine finance, which is what we provide, and our three competitors is that that is a marine mortgage and that means the, the loan that we provide is secured against the boat much of the personal loan finance that's available is being brokered and that tends to be secured as second charges on property and various other uh, options that may be not quite so transparent. Our facilities are available for um, all, all kinds of boats, whether it be canal boats and liverboards, which we are the only company in the UK providing those facilities through to sailing yachts, motorboats, and, and ribs. Um, typically, our facilities are over 10 years. We require a minimum of 20% deposit, although our average loan amount is probably only 60% of the boat purchase price. And whilst we offer a 10-year facility, most people are clearing off that debt between three and four years. And that is typical of marine finance. Um, our facilities can be settled and cleared at any time, and, and there's no penalty there. Our facilities are fixed rate or variable rate, so we offer a facility that's linked to bank base rate, or we will offer a full 10-year facility that's at a fixed rate. Um, we can do interest only, we can do bridging deals, um, and we can also assist with people that are buying new boats where the boat builder needs stage payments along their way. And the process starts very simply by our customers. We prefer it if they complete an online form that's on our website. Um, that just makes life so simple for us because 
that just gives us the the the, the basic information we need, which is a name and address, a date of birth, and then we request um, access to um, three months bank statements to in order to be able to assess affordability. Um, and with that information, uh, we we just follow up with a very brief telephone call. Um, you know, you need to like us, you need to understand us, we need to understand you, and typically that that decision period is taken um, within 24 hours of being in receipt of that full financial information. And when we make an offer, our offers, as I mentioned earlier, are subject to satisfactory title paperwork. Um, and that does vary quite a lot in the industry. Uh, Chris has given us the, the coastal ocean boat gold standard, um, but many brokers, including those inland who are also members of Abia, um, just don't have access to that information. So it takes a more flexible approach to be able to get to the to the goal where we and also you are happy that the boat you're buying will be yours when you bought it. Um, we also, if it's a used boat, insist on um, on an out of water pre-purchase survey. And we do require that surveyor to be a member of a professional uh, marine surveying organisation. Um, and then little things that have been mentioned about RCD. The RCD is quite clear in the coastal world. It's not quite so clear currently uh, for inland boats. Um, and something that's been prevalent in the last few years are uh, brokers and, and some vendors offering e-sign bills of sale. Um, as Chris mentioned, the MCA will not accept bill, e-sign bills of sale. We will not accept e-sign bills of sale, um, and it should be an area of concern um, that you should look into if, if that forms part of the, the title paperwork. Um, but yes, as, as also Chris mentioned, once once that um, transaction is ready to complete, we will hold on to the original paperwork um, until that loan has been settled, and, and I mentioned that can be done um, with, without penalty. Um, I think that's what I've got to say on that subject. I think it's covered it. If, uh... okay. Thanks, thanks, Stuart. I mean, the, the question has come in, which is quite pertinent to this. Uh, I, I think you touched on it. Um, Fiona Berry has asked, with finance, do you offer bridging loans to buy a boat while the house is on the market, then pay loan off when the house sells? Uh, we do. We have quite a lot of inquiries of that nature. It doesn't need to be restricted to a house sale. It can be but also linked to another boat sale awaiting completion. Um, and because our facilities are can be settled at any time, then there is no penalty in borrowing from us for the for a shorter period. I think the short well, I know for a fact the shortest period we've done was a boat bridging deal and that was a four day term. It was quicker than myself and also the buyer wanted to consider. But whether that be an interest only option or even a longer term mortgage, because, um, you know, I'm always advising people to borrow the least amount they need over the shortest period possible. No one ever takes that advice. They always borrow the maximum and over the longest period. And that's because they can settle at any time. But whether it's a bridging deal of any type, we always require a 20 percent minimum deposit. But of course, if there's a second boat involved, we can use the second boat as security, providing the affordability works for, for all parties. That's fantastic. Thank you. Thank, thank you for all that, Stuart. And now we sort of move on. We're going to quickly run through this next section. Chris, what are, I mean, we, we had a, we, we looked quite a lot into this sort of the boat sales advert, what you see in it, you know, you want to make sure the details are as accurate as possible but how how could you read an advert um or, or ha is are there red flags you should look out for in adverts when you're doing your research or things like that or so yeah back to the sort of broker private type of split um if you were finding a lot of the boats on apollo duck for example they may only have one or two photographs of the boat um so you, you put yourself at risk going to have a look at those boats when you've only literally seen one or two. As a broker, we will have probably about 25 or 30 photographs of the boat. There'll be some 3D imaging. There may even be um, drone footage. First thing you want to establish is 
are they the boat and are they recent? As I mentioned sort of earlier, we we'll quite often see adverts where people have used photographs of the boat from 10 years ago when it looked fantastic and now it's sitting in the corner of the boatyard. Um, the photos will tell you a lot if they're accurate. Um, a broker like myself will probably have a file of another 50 or 60 photographs that we are more than happy to share with buyers. Um, we normally do like a we transfer link. The reason they're not on the website is because they're in the inside of a, a locker. They're a close up of a windlass. Um, do you know I mean? It's all the little photos we take when we're wandering around the boat to give us a feel for it. Um, and so, yeah, check that the photos are the boat and they are reasonably recent. When you're looking at boat specs, again, after 25 years, I've learned the sort of things that Ben is looking for on boats. Ben will be mentioning, for example, the age of the standing rigging. He'll be mentioning the age of the sail drive seals and seacocks and other things that have sort of time related bits and pieces um, that may mean they need replacing after a certain amount. Hopefully a decent broker like me, and I, I, I say that casually because some people might not consider me to be a decent broker, but if you were to look at one of my specifications on a sailing yacht, for example, it should tell you how old the rigging is. It should tell you how old the sails are. There may be a gauge on there that the owner's given us that he rates his sails seven out of 10. Um, sail drive seals are a, a particularly sort of keen one. We know that Volvo recommend that a sail drive seal is replaced every seven years. So to save you the aggravation as the buyer of questioning, on my specification, it would say Volvo sail drive seal last replaced in and the date that it was done. When was the engine last serviced? Has it been serviced professionally? So a broker's job, and we tend to, we've sort of fine tuned this more so than perhaps an owner who just says, I've got a sea line S28 and it's fantastic. We will be looking at the various bits and pieces of that boat that we know impact you as the buyer you don't want to go and buy a boat only to be told by your surveyor that it needs new rigging new sails new this new that and new everything else and you then spend the next week or two arm wrestling with a vendor my specifications hopefully put my vendor and you in a really strong position the age of everything is detailed the price that we're advertising it for is with all of those items at that age so you're paying what we hope to be a fair price Ben's job then becomes a little bit easier because he's there to highlight the things that I wasn't aware of. Did you know, Chris, when we lifted the boat out, it didn't have a propeller on there? No, I didn't. That wasn't something that I could have been aware of before. So photos, accuracy of the spec sheets help you make your decision. As I say, on my specs, I also list the documents that we have for the boat. Again, I don't want you traveling halfway across the country um, if we haven't got the correct title paperwork for it. I personally would like to think it puts me in a slightly strong position. If you're looking at two Moody 38s online and my specification tells you how old the sails are, how old the rigging is, and has a list of all the title documents for that boat, I'd like to think you'll come and have a look at mine first. Um, due diligence has been done, as I say, before we list any of them. Um, maintenance undertaken and due. There's a question I think that popped up. So as a broker, a bit like an estate agent, I'm not responsible for your boat. It's still your boat if you're the vendor. I can give you lots of key tips about what to do. Um, where we are in my boatyard, we have a monthly guardian hour service where the cleaners come along and wash the decks down and keep everything presentable. If we notice something on the boat, like a leaking window, we will notify the vendor and ask them to put that right. It's in their interest, it's in my interest to have that done. But ultimately, they as the vendor are still responsible for that boat. I think I read one of the questions about when we're on a viewing, what can we do? Can we check electronics and stuff like that? The only thing I won't do on a viewing is start mechanicals, engines, water makers, heating systems, for example. Main reason I won't do that as a broker is because I don't know what state my owner has left his engine in. And at that point in time on a viewing, there isn't a contract. And if we turn the ignition key on that engine and the engine seizes, as nice as Mr. Boat Seller was on Monday, it'll be gunning for me on Tuesday when I've seized his engine. Um, similarly with um, heating systems, the amount of times that you start a heating system and can't find the stop button. So we won't do the mechanicals. Your offer that you're going to make on this boat, if you decide it's the right one, will always be subject to surveys and sea trials in theory. Um, so when you want to run the engines up, it will be done with either an engineer or a mechanic or a surveyor on board. 
And because there's a contract in place, the vendor has essentially given us not free range, we can't do anything destructive, but the contract makes provision for us to run his engine up with his permission. So yeah, if you're off to do viewings on boats, um, if it's with a broker, you unless there's sort of, if you want to run an engine, there's a, let me come in myself, if you phone me up and said, I'm coming down from Scotland to look at your Sunseeker 58, and the first thing I want to do when I get down there is run the engines up, we will have asked the owner in advance whether or not he's happy for us to do it on that day. Um, there is a horror story of a broker essentially seizing an engine. Um, the owner had forgotten to tell him that he'd taken all the injectors out. The broker was reasonably new, started the engine, diesel flew around everywhere. Horrible, horrible mess. Owner was very apologetic. I should have told you, but it got sticky. So, yeah, that's we will allow you to look at everything. Prod, poke, open, close, do what you need to do. But as I say, until the boat's under offer, won't be necessarily any running up of engines. I think also um, from the talking from the for sale advert point of view, it's also the reputation of what you see and how it's advertised, because uh, you know Chris from Boat Point obviously large network, but there are some very small independent brokers, but there are an awful lot of people who try and sell their boat privately, and sometimes uh, I've been in the situation on behalf of the insurance company where someone has actually sold someone's boat, they didn't own it. Uh, and the for sale notice was actually stuck on the outside of the boat. And people have walked along the towpath and, and basically phoned that mobile number. Someone's appeared and they've done a deal with no proof of ownership, no nothing. So again, this comes back to what Chris is saying. No matter whether you're buying from a broker or an owner, it's really important to understand that sometimes if you see something that's too good to be true, it might be. And, and obviously the, the the flag there is clear on, especially on a narrow boat, is if the advert's stuck on the outside of the window, not on the inside, because they obviously didn't have proper access to it. Um, again, with um, the accuracy of the details, Chris has taken most of my uh, thunder right. of, 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 of what we look for. But I do regularly say to buyers, before you actually get a, a pay for surveyor, because we're not cheap, have you lifted the sole boards? Have you looked around the boat? Have you paid any attention to the structural elements of the boat as well that you may or may not understand? But sometimes I get someone saying, oh, I, I noticed there was water coming through um, a window or a, a chain plate, or I noticed there was water standing off in the bilges. So it, it's things like that of asking things. The one you did, uh, you mentioned sail drives, but the other one is on a shaft. If you've got the uh, deep sea seal type stuff, um does the does the lip seals need to be changed so there you are there's one i you haven't thought of um but no it, it's really it's really important to ask those questions and again many brokers don't list them in fact i've just recently done a yacht where the age of the rigging wasn't on the paperwork i asked the the buyer to check before we traveled all the way down to look at the boat and it turned out the rigging was nearly 15 years old um, and they were planning to go transatlantic. No one in their right mind is going to say that's okay uh, to take the gamble on. And um, yeah. And I think the thing there, Ben, as you say, is that if you're the buyer and you don't know how old the rigging is and you make your offer, it's more the, it tend, it's, it's the slowing up of the process. You've made yeah. your offer on what you believe is a yacht with fully functioning, fully compliant rigging. Ben will then tell you that the rigging's 15, 16 years old and will absolutely make a recommendation that it's going to be replaced. At which point you have to go back to your vendor and explain to them, I'd still like to buy this boat, but I now want to negotiate the costs. And that's where you tend to hit this stumbling block, particularly if you're buying privately. As I say, a broker hopefully will have sort of negated some of that, but we spend a lot of our time discussing with our owners why the buyer wants to buy the boat, but wants to negotiate. And that would be considered a requirement. Your rigging's well past its sell-by date. Um, the buyer didn't know that, and therefore they would like to renegotiate accordingly. So, but, yeah. But I mean, the, the, the classic one is that you always get sometimes is it's been perfectly all right all the time we've owned it. But the trouble is, if you're trying to borrow money from uh, companies like Stuart with Po Marine, you are in a position where Stuart is probably a bit loath to lend the money if we say that the keel fastings need checking or the rudder blade needs replacing or the rig needs replacing because he knows straight away there's a couple of bills coming 
Is that not the case, Stuart? Well, I think, um, you know, I, I don't know whether you've been prompted to say that, Ben, but... No, not at all, um, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just telling the truth as I see it. Yeah, no, absolutely right. I, I, I am joking, but um, I think where where we are different in the marketplace because we are boat owners and particularly sailors, then the buyer will also discuss with us where there tends to be um, a bit of a, a different opinion between the surveyor and the broker. And we've certainly been involved in that. And that was the case I thought you were referring to, Ben, to be honest, where at Southampton Boat Show, where we were running a similar exercise mm. to this, I had the broker on, on the phone to me in one ear. Ben and the buyer were at the, the presentation we were giving in the other ear. And I was caught in the middle. But at least with boating experience, we can kind of bring some neutrality, but also balances to where where the sensible outcome is which is not always obvious thank you yeah. thank you for that um on we're, we're going to move on um we've covered quite a lot of this next slide already um so chris i mean regarding the role of the broker is there anything we've sort of missed in the in the bits we've done before uh, that's it i'm basically here to make buyers and sellers lives easier um, to remove the awkwardness of discussing things. Um, the classic one is owners will often ask me, can they come along on the first viewings and stuff? And I always say no, because with the greatest respect to all you buyers out there, you will lie through your teeth if the owner is on board. You will tell him that his boat is the best boat you've ever been on. And five minutes later, as you're walking up the pontoon holding your nose because the boat smells of cigarettes or dogs, um, you'll tell me you don't want to buy it. The owner comes in five minutes later. Oh, they were lovely, that couple. They're going to buy my boat. Mm. So think of me as the middleman, the person, the, the deflector of the S word, um, there to make life easy, to make sure that you are getting the best service you can in terms of the representation of the boat, the safety and the sort of the, the confidence that if you buy through a broker, you're not going to get your fingers burnt later down the line. And we haven't mentioned things about the, the money aspect of it. All decent brokers like ourselves will have a client account, um, something that's getting increasingly hard yeah. to get our hands on because of the banking situation. But it's basically putting you in a very safe position of a buyer that no matter what you do, there isn't going to be a gun held to your head um, and you shouldn't come out of it sort of financially worse off if you decide not to buy it. Chris, you, you mentioned actually just a minute ago um, at the start about RCD stuff and yes. boats coming in from America. Yes. Now, I've quite regularly seen that where we've got what I call the grey imports. Yep. Um, I've done a couple of insurance claims. I'm going to really throw one here to Paul. The insurance company I work for actually declined it because they said that under the conditions of the insurance, if the boat is not covered by the RCD, it was not covered on insurance. And I'll be honest with you, I haven't checked that, but is that still the case with a lot of insurance companies with, with RCD? Each insurance company will have their own viewpoint on it. I think the logical sense of the matter is, is that if the claim is particularly relevant to the RCD or some aspect of the RCD, then yes, it could be called into question. However, if your boat has been stolen, then it's nothing to do with the RCD. Your claim will probably be paid. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember it was one of the um, electric stoves because they used a um, downloader, one of these um, AC, hundred and ten to two forty, and basically cooked itself in in the in the cabin. So no, I just just thought I'd just throw that one in and upset you. <laughs> Never upset me. I'll be it's, it's an interesting one because it's really be hard sometimes. Up. It's really hard sometimes to prove uh, RCD and stuff if the paperwork is not there. Um, so it's becoming increasingly um, prevalent. I mean, look, we live in a litigious world. Um, everybody's out to get each other and nobody wants to be accountable for anything. So, again, a broker is going to have done those checks for you. We are technically able to sell non-RCD um, categorised boats as long as we have made it abundantly clear in the specification that a particular boat currently does not have RCD um, uh, paperwork, you can buy that boat, you can put it through an RCD um, check and um, sign off, 
And as long as the boat complies and you spend your money to make it comply, the boat can then be given a post-construction certificate. So it really comes down to, again, making sure that when you're chatting with your broker, if they have got a non-compliant boat, you are fully aware of your obligations. What you don't want to do is buy a boat going, oh, yeah, I'll get the RCD sorted next week, only mm -hmm. to realise that it's £2,500 for the certificate plus whatever costs are associated with it bringing it up to uh, up to standards. Yeah. Brilliant. And, and it can delay sale by a couple of months, can't it? Yeah. Couple, couple of questions that have come in for you, Chris. One yes. of them, if a boat is uh, an American import coming into the UK and the person buying it wants to take it straight out of the UK, is there a way that it doesn't have to be RCD? No. Well, where they're going to take it would be my first question. Outside the EU, let's say, for example. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, so back to that, you can bring a boat into the UK, you'll have to pay your VAT because you are importing it from America. So I, I question why we were going down this scenario. But if you bought yep. a boat in America, you bought it into the UK, you will have to pay VAT because you are importing that boat from outside yep. the UK. You wouldn't have to have RCD because you're not offering it for sale. So RCD, the, the key wording in here is it's at the point that the boat is first offered for sale in the UK or the EU. So yes, on paper, you could do that. Buy the boat, bring it into the UK, pay 20% and then bugger off. Why would you bring it here in the first place? Yeah, that, fair enough. Why pay 20% for the sake well, of... I was thinking the next person buying it might be exporting it out. Ah, so yeah, you can't sell it. He, that person yeah, that brought okay. it in couldn't sell it without it having a certificate. Cool. Um, Questions coming. Are CD and VAT does are, does are the equivalent RCD and VAT apply to paperwork requirements when buying a UK narrowboat? Appreciate you're not a narrow uh, inland. Well, but well, if if we forget the word boat, if a company has sold a product, that product should have a VAT invoice. If you go yeah. to Curry's and buy a computer, you will pay VAT on that computer because Curry's have to account for the VAT. With the narrow, I mean, there's there's a few exemptions on RCD. If it's a home built boat, for example, you can get away with not having RCD as long as you don't sell it within a certain time frame. The simplistic answer, without going too technical, is a canal boat should have our um, VAT evidence because somebody built the boat. Ben's going to jump in here. The materials would have had a VAT invoice. The engine would have had a VAT invoice. So you could argue that. If it's a, and again, forgive me, Ben, if you're using it solely as a place of residence, it can come zero rated for VAT. But if you're using it as a boat, it should have VAT status. And again, the inland waterways is a bit of a gray area for me, but my understanding was that they should have category D rating. Over to you, right. Ben. I knew you guys would like to throw that one to me. Um, <laughs> so well, it's why I sell boats on the South Coast, not on the rivers. Yeah. So, with the RCD, you do need to be a bit careful because with the sail away, the builder uh, should complete his part of uh, of the declaration of conformity. And then even the person uh, fitting out the boat, whether it's a sail away as a non-private per a private person or a fit-out company, there is certainly, um, you need to provide the evidence that everything you put in that boat has got a CE or UK mark in it. Um, you've caught me on something that I don't tend to get too involved with because it is just such, such a minefield. But with regards to VAT on a, um, a barge, uh, there is a tonnage point, um, which again, my gray cells, I can't actually remember the, the, the tonnage, but I'm sure someone will tap it in and tell me very quickly. Um, if the barge is over certain capacity, again, it can be VAT exempt. Um, so there's something to be a bit careful on that, of, of the yeah. capacity of the vessel. I think people, everybody buying a boat gets a little bit hung up on VAT. Um, there are reasons for that. When we were part of the EU, everybody was convinced when they sailed their little Westerly Centaur over to France, there was going to be a little French man with his hat on um, questioning the VAT status of the boat. Nothing has changed. We're just now no longer part of the EU. If you want to take your boat into Europe, there's a form called a 1331 form. It's all very boring. You fill it in. It's basically an export declaration. I'm taking my boat and my crew to Europe for a period of time, as long as it's less than 18 months. 
and I will return to the UK. And essentially, you're doing what you do at an airport. You're saying, we have nothing to declare. There's nothing on this boat that is liable for VAT or tax when we take it into Europe. You bring it back. Since Brexit, my life did get a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. I used to lose the sale of a 1978 Wesley Centaur because the original VAT invoice wasn't there. And Mr. Smith was convinced he would need to pay VAT on it. If you can show evidence that your boat was in the UK on the 31st of December 2020, the day of Brexit, UK Customs consider that boat to be a UK VAT status boat. And the best analogy I can use that I do every day in the office, if you go to a car boot sale on Sunday and buy a secondhand telly, there is nobody from Customs and Revenue waiting to charge VAT on that television. It's a secondhand good sold between two UK nationals within the UK. That TV has no VAT liability. And that TV has the same legal status as a boat. It just doesn't float as well. So if we accept <laughs> the fact that you can buy a TV and not worry about VAT, you can buy a boat and not worry about VAT. My job as a broker is to look through the history of that boat to find out, for example, was it imported from America two weeks ago by somebody that wanted to bring it into the UK? Has it come in from the Channel Islands? Or the most common one is, did a business own that boat five or six years ago that may have reclaimed the VAT, sold it to one of their directors for a pound, hasn't declared the VAT status on it and has then sold it on subsequently? So there are VAT implications and a broker will look through the history of the boat to clarify that. But essentially as a buyer, don't get too hung up on it. If you're buying a secondhand boat, in theory, it's deemed VAT paid. Brilliant. Thanks, Chris. Um, typically, what this is coming, uh, typically, what percentage of the final sale price does the broker charge? Now, that's an, always an interesting Who's question. asking, a buyer or a seller? Because <laughs> <laughs> for, for the buyer, it really doesn't matter. You are paying the price for that boat that you think is a fair price. But without dodging this question, your average broker in the UK is charging 6% plus VAT. Um, for sole brokerage, um, it tends to go up to 8% if it's co-brokerage. Co-brokerage is kind of a thing of the past because of the internet. I used to share lots of my listings with brokers around the country before the internet because I wanted everybody trying to help me sell my boats. These days, as I say, the internet's sort of pretty much done away with that. Um, you will find bedroom brokers that will go significantly lower. But the reason for that is that when you phone or when you're actually it doesn't really impact on you. But when the buyer phones up a bedroom broker and wants to view a boat on a Tuesday afternoon and that guy's working in KFC, so can't get out of work on time to do the viewing. That's why they can get away with charging two or three percent. Um, we have offices. We're here seven days a week. Um, and as I say, the, the UK industry average is six percent. If you're over in Europe selling a boat, you will get charged 10 percent. That's a fact. And, and uh, actually, Chris, uh, some of the brokers abroad also um, charge a finder's fee. So if you are buying abroad, be very aware that some of the brokers will charge a finder's fee at the negotiation. And fee. don't forget, so the the, the 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 thing that quite often gets thrown at us, particularly from the vendors, as to why am I paying you all that when I can sell my house for one or two percent. Don't forget, we are doing all the legal conveyancing. If you add up the total sale of your property paying for the solicitors, getting the checks done, getting the searches done, you might find that that 1.5% is actually a lot closer to what we're charging. Um, so as a buyer, don't be put off. As a vendor, if you want to twist my arm and, and get me to drop my commission, give me a good reason to. Let me make your boat a, a an easy boat for me to sell. Let's talk about the price of the boat and let's, uh, let's all come out of this smelling of roses. Fantastic, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on now to get a little bit more into the, the, mm. the surveyor's input into all this. Now, obviously, we've spoken a lot about this as well. So, Ben, if you could just fill in the gaps for us. OK, so there's my famous hammer. Um, so, okay. yeah, so. Um, generally speaking, the surveyor is only acting on behalf of one person, that's the buyer. And it's important that people understand when they instruct the surveyor what they're expecting and i've done talks quite regularly on on the expectations of what a surveyor can and can't see um i don't think you should ever shy away from actually asking the surveyor can you attend some surveyors don't want someone there all day long some surveyors say come see me around lunchtime and we'll 
discuss the findings and where we are. I, I always think it's a good idea to see the boat out of the water if you are able to attend, because it does help. Um, but again, at the time when you're going looking around the boat, if there's things you're not sure of, I would rather you say to the surveyor, um, and I, I don't know a surveyor who doesn't like this, is if you spot something you're not happy with, I would far rather you say to the surveyor before he goes, look, when you're looking at this, could you look at this? I, I've seen this item that I'm not sure of, or I don't know how that works, because it's far better for the surveyor to report the finding of that and make sure he knows it works. I mean, the classic one is a diesel heater. We've had it before now where it doesn't work or he's not sure of its installation. When we're there, we can actually look at it and we can actually arrange with the boker to make sure it is working. If it's not working, it gives the opportunity to the boker to check with the owner why it's not working. And sometimes it's as simple as the fact that the fuel tank's not full enough, so nothing's working. You know, there's lots of little things like that of actually trying to sort it out. The other, the other classic one is like um, uh, sea trials. Um, some people will ring up, ask for survey advice, and then on the day they say, what about the sea trial? Well, for sea trial, you need to make sure that you, A, told the boker that's what you want in your conditions, because quite often, I'm sure you found it before now, Chris, they will they, they turn up and say they bought three people, four people with them, and they expect to go out on sea trial at survey. And it's like, this isn't going to happen like this. You've got to make sure we all know what you want uh, from the survey and the sea trial. And again, weather can be quite um, a, a bit of a problem in this country. Um, the highlights uh, within the report, you know, should be reported quite clearly as, uh, and it should be a factual report of, of the condition of what you're finding. I, I quite often find that a lot of survey reports that I see these days, especially with insurance uh, claims, there's very little actual word and there's an awful lot of photographs, which sometimes mean actually nothing to the buyer um, because they don't know what they're looking for. You know, very nice photographs, but what are you trying to show me? So it's really important that the wording within the report is clear. And again, if you're not sure, I and mean, I've heard it so many times, I've had the survey report, but someone actually hasn't acted upon the things that are important within that report when it's provided because they didn't understand what the surveyor meant. So again, do not be frightened that the relationship with your surveyor shouldn't just be that one day of attending. It should be beforehand, asking the questions, checking what you want to know. And then when you've got the report, making sure you actually understand what's right and what's wrong. It, it should be pretty obvious in a survey report, but sometimes people don't really fully understand the, the importance of some of the things that we find. Um, how to find a trusted surveyor? Well, as I said, I'm, I'm a member of the YDSA. It's the oldest surveying association in, in the UK. Uh, there are other surveying associations like IIMS and SCMS. They all have different levels of membership grading. It's important if you are trying to find a surveyor, sometimes ask the broker. Brokers sometimes will have uh, lists of surveyors. Uh, the funny thing is sometimes people don't like that because they say, oh, is that surveyor trying to guide me to a, a surveyor that works too closely with them? At the end of the day, they're all professionals. They should, should be helping you find a simple solution to a, what should be a simple process. Um, but sometimes, you know, I, I've travelled all over the UK because I've got repeat business of clients who've used me time and time again. And you talk to any surveyor, you've got some people who are on their third or fourth boat with a surveyor. And, you know, you still get phone calls two or three months, two or three years, you know, further on down the line of things they're doing with the boats and asking for top ups of advice. So, you know, it is really important to have that good relationship with the surveyor and, you know, see what you can do from there how's that do paul that that's all fantastic and moving on to the survey report itself um obviously we've we've been through a lot of what's covered in there is there something is you know there's obviously a management of expectation if you're buying a 1980 yeah. westerly centaur uh you're not getting a brand new boat i think that's actually probably one of the hardest things um is the understanding of what is right and wrong with the boat of an of an age and understanding where things are right and wrong. You know, obviously on a on a 30-year-old boat, if you've got teak, don't be surprised if the teak's on the end of its life. You know, we've already touched on rigging and sail drives. You know, but there are what I call the service lists. So 
again, I, I try really hard, and I know lots of surveyors who try really hard to try and say to the buyer, look, when you're down at the boat, check all these dominoes, make sure that you've got all these things done, because at the end of the day, you know, we are trying to help you in the process of making sure that what you're buying is is what you want. Um, I'm very I'm very firm with people that I sometimes get people ring me up, and I'm sure Chris is going to smile at this point, um, so wait for it. I get people ring me up and say, I've offered too much for the boat, I need to knock 15, 20 grand off, do you think you can help me on that? And frankly, I say no, because I'm not here to do that. I'm here to give an honest report. I'm working for you as a as a, as a client, but I'm not here to try and bend and reduce and knock and be used as a chipping hammer to reduce the price of a vessel. Um, you know, it's, so it's a really important one. Um, as to reading the report, again, the, the, the report should be written in such a way that you should, at any level of understanding, be able to understand what the survey is getting at. Um, but if you don't understand it, you shouldn't feel like it's a stupid question to ask the survey what he means. All too often, I've been to insurance claims uh, where someone has actually clearly had it spelt out. There was a problem with something, but they didn't understand what the survey meant, so they shied away from the question. And, it, and, and it's really important to try and do that. Um, and again, why are they important? Well, the report after you've bought the boat will be used by people like Stuart and people like Paul in the underwriting and the finance to A, ensure it's a good risk that they've lent the money against that and it's not going to be on the bottom of the pond tomorrow. And exactly the same reason why Paul wants to know, because at the end of the day, they're trusting the surveyor to give a pragmatic report that is accurate. There's nothing worse than saying this is a fantastic boat. Um, the sails are brand new, the guy insures it all, and then the guy puts in a claim for a new set of sails, and when you turn up, they're, they're 15, 20 years old. You know, so there's lots of things like that that you need to make sure that the report is accurate about the condition of the boat, because if not, your claim will get rejected just as much as any other reason. Um, Can I and I for a second? Sorry, Paul. Um, no, I was just going to... Sorry, if you carry on, Chris. No, I was going to... So tying in exactly what Ben's just said, how to read your report, most surveyors, Ben included, when we see these reports, they tend to be broken down into a list of requirements and recommendations. Um, your rudder's about to fall off if you don't tighten up the rudder stock nut. That is a requirement. No matter what happens next, that job needs to be done. And that's something where we would turn back to our vendor and say, even if this guy pulls out of buying your boat, you've still got to go down the route of tightening up your mm -hmm. rudder stock. And so we would yeah. be in a very strong position to negotiate costs on that. If the surveyor comes back and says the plastic um, uh, perspex windows in the spray hood are a little bit opaque and could do with replacing, you're going to struggle to negotiate that number off your purchase price. One, because it was arguably visible on the day of the viewing when you looked at the boat, but also it doesn't prevent you using it. So it's very easy for me as a broker, if I've got a list of requirements from a surveyor, things that need to be done, things that are launch critical, things that are broken, then clearly we're able to go back to our vendor. And the best and that's the story I can tell you about this, I had a vendor, he'd listed a boat with us for sale. Um, the surveyor came down and said, everything's pretty much hunky-dory, but I can't find the water maker. We went back to the vendor and said, surveyor can't find the water maker. And at first I thought, I've got one of these surveyors that didn't really look. Well, he'd have had to go a long way to look because it was on a boat in the Mediterranean. The guy had bought a water maker, had intended to fit it to his boat in the UK, decided not to put it on the boat in the Med. But when he wrote his spec up and signed it off for us, it included a water maker. Now, clearly, the guy buying the boat thought he was getting a water maker. It cost that chap about eight and a half thousand pounds to sell his boat because we ended up negotiating on something that wasn't there. It wasn't working. So. Right. I've, I've, had, in those ways. I've had a number of those. I could bore you to tears with them. Uh, but certainly things like anchor winches, not on boats, fridges, which are or freezers. Um, and, and the worst one actually is your electronics packages. Uh, before now, I've actually had clear evidence that it had the new all signal dancing interfaced electronics package, 25 Ks worth of electronics. And on the day of survey, what I was looking at was all analog stuff. The guy had actually swapped it over between the visit um, of the of the client. Brings us back to that specification. 
when we list a boat for a vendor, we won't just say it's got a chart plotter, it's got a VHF. We will list makes and models and if known ages for exactly that reason. You are making your offer on that specification sheet, which the vendor signed off on the first day he put it up for sale. And it's fundamentally legally binding. That's what you are. You're making your offer against. So if, as Ben says, you thought you were getting the latest touchscreen Raymarine and what you've got is an old RL70, you are perfectly within your rights to renegotiate. Yeah. So I mean, it is I mean, really important. I mean, it used to be in, in the old days. The fact is that when you're when you're buying a boat from a, through a broker, you've got the vendor and the purchaser in there. There is, you know, it's a secondhand boat. There is no warranty. Your survey is your only sight of what the boat's actual condition is. That is the one that you that people are going to take because there is no warranty. You rely on your surveyor to give you what the condition of that boat is. Well, again, I think that's a really valid point of reasons why quite a few surveyors like myself do like the client to come around because you get a more understanding appreciation of what we can and can't see. And again, um, you know, it's something I'm sure Chris spends hours talking to uh, sellers on <clears throat> is actually preparing the boat for sale and removing all the junk off the boat that isn't actually part of the sale because, again, that can confuse the, the buyer that he thinks he's getting a, a fantastic toolkit. Uh, I've actually had boats where they've got a spare propeller on them. Uh, is that with a sail? No, that's going into the next boat. You know, all sorts of stuff does get moved off a boat. So it's really important that if you're selling a boat, help the broker to help you by removing all the stuff you don't want as part of the sale. You know, I appreciate some people that towards the end of their sailing cycle just chuck everything in because it makes it more attractive. But sometimes you can have sort of two or three tons worth of kit on board the boat which is actually just cluttering the boat uh, and and actually making the sale quite difficult because you can't really see what's there and also take your milk out the fridge um okay a couple oh, of questions God, are yes. coming a couple of questions are coming for you ben if the <laughs> if the boat has a survey in place which is only eight months old and looks good would you recommend another one before buying uh well there's an interesting question so earlier stuart if you listen to stuart if you're borrowing money, you can't buy or borrow money on that survey because it's not assigned to you. Um, I've had a few people actually ask me about assigning a survey that I've done on a boat two years ago. And I said, do you know where the boat's been in the last two years? No. I said, well, nor do I. Um, I, th I think, to be brutally honest with you, the only time I've ever assigned or recommended a survey to be assigned is when the boat has been in exactly the same place, a sure. And before I've assigned it, I've actually had a quick walk back around it to make sure that it's exactly as it was the day I saw it. I would never recommend um, relying on the survey report. And in fact, some insurance companies will no longer um, accept surveys um, that are not assigned to the owner. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, yeah, I, I must admit it's one of those, it's one of those things you don't know what's happened to that boat. But but as as you just said, in in certain cases, if the surveyor that was used for that original survey, if you can get him back to do another walk round, is that might be a, a, a better way of doing only, it. Or? Only on only on time scales. Yeah, I will tell you. Um, I can't obviously mention the name of the surveyor, but a couple of years ago, I did a survey on a boat for a pre purchaser. And I found a load of things wrong with it. And this guy had only owned the boat for a couple of months and he bought it off a previous survey. And I was a bit concerned about the condition of what I found. And I actually rang the surveyor to say, look, I'm on this boat and this is clearly not right. Are you aware of this? And it actually turned out that the seller had actually doctored the surveyor's report. Right. So, And that is actually 100% gospel. Um, so, again, I would warn people of sometimes an over clean, amazing report of a boat. It's it's not normal for us surveyors to find everything absolutely 100 percent perfect. Cool. Uh, another Chris question. For... Stuart will vouch. <laughs> another question for you, Ben. Is there a ballpark cost of a survey? Yeah. Um, so. When my uncle was surveying. They worked on this length times breadth times depth um, algorithm between surveyors at about six shillings a foot. Um, mm. But now, uh, I'll be honest with you, it tends to work 
um, on, uh, I, well, certainly a lot of surveyors I know are working more on a day rate plus travel costs. So um, something around about 40 foot long sailing yacht is, is going to be in that sort of, I hate using prices because everyone's different, but between the eight and a thousand with travel and depending on where you are, possibly a hotel as well. Um, if if you're going abroad, don't expect to get a survey for less than three and a half, four thousand pounds because it's a four day trip and you've also got to make sure it's 100 percent right before you leave. You've got to allow yourself an extra day. But, you know, on the value of the vessel, it's it can be the best thing you've spent. Brilliant. OK, Ben, thank you very much. Oh, we're going to uh, this is always a little bit of a tricky one, but is there are there occasions when you should be bringing, when you should be consulting a lawyer or when you should be bringing a lawyer in? So there's, an there's your answer, those three bullet points. Um, <laughs> so one of the hardest times I ever have is when I'm actually selling a boat to somebody in the legal profession because they look at uh, um, a sale and purchase agreement and they start tearing it apart because they once did some conveyancing on a, on a house and they decide that they're now legal experts. A decent broker will have had their sale and purchase agreement drawn up by um, uh, a decent solicitor. We use uh, LA Marine, arguably the UK's biggest um, marine insurance company. But if you are going to enter into a private sale and you don't want to engage the services of a broker, and I'll be perfectly honest, if somebody walked in here and said, I'm going to buy a boat privately, can you help with the paperwork? The answer is yes, for a fee that will be significantly less than your solicitor. The problem you have if you go down the lawyer route on the sort of value of boats that we're talking about, the costs rack up very quickly because let's be perfectly honest, most solicitors are just going to look at the legal contract. They're not going to know whether a bill of sale is a bill of sale. They're not going to know whether the RCD is the RCD. All they're actually going to do is come back to a broker like me and we get cast quite a lot by um, uh, solicitors to certify documents because they're not sure. And I scratch my head thinking there's a poor buyer out there that's paying the solicitor. I've just charged the solicitor for my professional advice. And all that's being added onto this chap's um, uh, costs. So you would do it if you were absolutely adamant on buying the boat privately. It was absolutely the right boat for you. You didn't want to use a broker or the vendor didn't want to use a broker. Then you may consider using a lawyer to, to look at your documents for you. High value boats. I think we sort of set a target for this one up to about 350, if I'm right, Paul. If you're entering into the million pound market and you are dealing particularly internationally, um, then yes, it's probably worth getting a lawyer. If you've got companies selling boats, companies that are registered offshore, you should probably contact a lawyer um, because I, as a broker, have a set of knowledge and experience which means that I can sell UK boats quite easily with all the experience I've built up but if somebody comes in and says this com this particular boat for two million quid is owned offshore by Joe Bloggs company that's registered here and the uh, the owners of it are here and that's when you get your lawyers involved and a lot of those big sort of European um, mega yachts you do use a lawyer and I guess the third point there complications no matter how well I try to keep my deals on track every so often, and I'm talking two or maybe three in 25 years, it does go a bit belly up at the end. Buyers and sellers fall out. Um, one accuses the other one of being in breach of contract. The other one denies it. I'm not legally qualified to tell either one of them who's in the right and who's in the wrong. And our agreement will tell you that this agreement is um, governed by uh, UK and Welsh law. And if it goes belly up, the protection you have when you're buying through a broker is that the deposit will sit in our client accounts, in the escrow account, until such time as the lawyers decide who should get it. And that's fundamentally for the buyer and the vendor to arm wrestle at a lot of cost with the um, solicitor's fees racking up. Because again, the solicitors don't know what they're doing. So it takes them two hours to find the answer and they're charging you for that two hours but that's when i think as i say three times i can recall in 25 years where we've ended up having to um ask a buyer and a seller to contact their individual solicitors and for them to effectively stake their claim on the boat um it goes on for about three months 
And for that whole period of time, your deposit is tied up in an account, so you don't get that back. The vendor can't sell his boat to anybody else whilst it's all going legal. And so my advice to both parties is, chill your beans, go and have half a pint of beer, come back and chat to me in an hour's time. Once you've cleared your head, you can have your deposit back tomorrow. The vendor can get his boat advertised. You can both walk away from this without any costs or any aggravation. Yeah. But it doesn't always work that way. People are right. I, I, I think, you know, there is in the industry some really good marine fine, uh, marine lawyers. Um, and I think, you know, in fairness, so, some of them are absolutely on the ball. You mentioned with the YDSA and Abia, we tend to use um, LA Marine. But there are several others out there. And it, it is the fact that really you don't want to be using a high street solicitor. Absolutely. You need to use yeah. a specialist. And sometimes the advice you give, they'll give it they'll give you half an hour for free and sometimes that's all you need to get a clear head of what you need to do and 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 basically everyone saves a lot of grief um Stuart with um your side of financing you do a lot of the um stuff yourself do you or how does it work yeah we do we do do a lot of ourselves um we also work with LA Marine, LA Marine on, on occasions our competitors will always push their documentation through a marine lawyer and you're looking at a minimum of a thousand pounds per transaction whereas ourselves we can we can do the same conveyancing aspect that chris will do um bear in mind a lot of brokers don't do what chris does so we will yeah. often take that role and particularly if it's a private sale which we're happy to complete on then we will certainly insist on on that documentation um if it's registry with the mca which we don't do for every boat but we will do for some then we will do that for ourselves um, and we we pass those costs on the charge mm -hmm. um, those charges on at cost which for uh, an yeah. mca registered vessel which you need if you're going to take the boat abroad is about 250 quid more or less yeah i, I should actually say that if you're thinking about getting your boat uh, on finance with requirement of the british part one it's well worth telling the surveyor at the time because he can actually if the boat is not already uh, part one registered or it's lapsed it needs to be remeasured so mm -hmm. it's like if you tell the surveyor at the time it, it actually saves another couple of weeks there the surveyor can put his tape measure over and, and and record all those details ready for it should it be required mm -hmm. so i mean that's uh, another thing um, that i think pretty much almost without exception our competitors will always want their their boats registered with the MCA. So yeah. you will need a tonnage survey if you're going down that yeah. route. And you will have legal costs, regardless of the, the amount or size borrowed or the size of the vessel. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Lawyers done that. So we've got we've done that, we've gone through the whole process. We now move on to these. I know we've covered also covered quite a lot of this. Um, but what good to repeat. When do you know you're ready to complete? Yeah. Well, Stuart, funds. When do I get my money, Stuart? Well, well, yeah, I suppose so. Um, we've we've covered Ben's happy with his um, survey and the, the buyer's happy with the survey. We're happy with the survey. We're happy with the title paperwork that Chris has, will be preparing. And at that point, we will issue finance documents for our customers to sign. Um, and whilst we will not accept e-signed bills of sale, nearly every transaction for the last four years, five years we've been doing is um, is an e-signed finance contract. Um, and so that literally takes three or four minutes. As long as it takes you to log into Adobe Sign, click and sign it, job done. We then let the broker know that the deal's ready, customer's happy, and as soon as we've got a copy of a undated signed bill of sale from Chris, copy of an insurance contract that has got us noted as an interested party with the customer happy to pay, we, we, we send the money to Chris. Yeah. And so what Stuart's just mentioned there, I will have had, so you've had your survey. Fundamentally, as soon after that survey that you tell me you're happy, that's when I start collating the paperwork. As a broker, I don't want 
dozens and dozens of files of original documents in my office. So we ask the owners to keep them. We will have scanned them all on the day of listing, but the owner will have those at home nice and safe. So you tell me a uh, day or two after your survey, once you've got your report that you want to proceed, I let my vendor know. The vendor will come down with their boat file, with all of their documents, manuals, receipts, whatever it happens to be. And I will have a bill of sale prepared for them on my desk, transferring ownership from them to you. Um, that has to be a wet copy. Um, that can't be done digitally, as Stuart mentioned. There was a very brief moment in time with COVID when the MCA were prepared to accept um, electronic signatures on bills of sale, but they've now revoked that. So um, that has to be done in the office. So I have all of the receipts, all of the paperwork, all of the VAT, the RCD, um, and yeah, I'm at that point ready to go. Once you say release the funds, um, she becomes your boat. I will always remind you on that day because you're so excited about buying this boat and going sailing. I'll be just saying to you, look, before I press send on the uh, the finance button, have you insured it? And that's when they go, oh, no, right. At which point I will say to them, let's just delay completion for 24 hours. Because I guarantee you the one day that the Sputnik or the International Space Station is going to drop out the sky, you can guarantee it's going to be the day of completion. And the only boat in the yard that isn't insured, yours, mm. is the one it's going to hit. So we will, again, just let the vendor know that there's a slight delay for 24 hours whilst the uh, purchaser gets their insurance sorted, and then we'll let it go. Two reasons for that. One, I don't want you to go off on an uninsured boat and have an accident on the first day, because, again, being brutally honest, that's when most accidents on new boats happen. It's that first day of ownership. You're not quite sure how well it goes forwards and backwards. You're not quite sure how fast it goes forwards and backwards. Um, you're in a new marina that you're not familiar with. So having insurance in place on day one, really, really insure, important. I work as part of the Boat Folk group. So we've got 11 marinas. My marina team will want to know that that boat is insured for the purposes of relaunching, for the purposes of berthing, so that if you accidentally blow your boat up because it's the first time you've turned the gas on, that you're covered and so are the people next door to you. Um, so another good reason for having insurance in place. We've put mooring in there. Most of you that are buying boats will probably have somewhere to park your boat. You'd be a little bit crazy to go and buy a 46 to 50 foot boat in the UK at the moment and not have somewhere lined up for it. Spaces are at a premium still on the, uh, the larger stuff. If you're speaking to your broker at the point that you're making an offer, discuss moorings with them. As I say, I'm, I work for a big marina group. We have the facility to find you moorings if you're unsure. Um, we get discounts because you're buying as part of the group. So if you're in those things, speak to your broker. I know, for example, that down here on the River Hamble, there are quite a lot of conservancy moorings that are currently available, relatively speaking, inexpensively. We have that, inside, not insider information, but we can point you in the right direction if you're struggling to find somewhere to keep the boat. Brilliant. And just going back to the insurance, just going back to the insurance point, just to add a little bit in there. I should probably mention that I'll quote and buy. You can get a quote online and then get insured straight away. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> you can you can do the insurance quite quickly. If Presumably, you're Paul, that's together. like the like the cover notes that you get on a car. You phone up and you you insure there and then with a get out clause after two weeks if you need to. Uh, do I mean yeah? You've got the you've got the fourteen day cooling off period. Yeah. Yeah, but you would get cover there and then. Yeah, yeah. Literally, as, soon, as soon as you paid the money, you're now, in your cabin. Interestingly, because this comes up quite a lot post-survey, um, quite a lot of my buyers turn around to me and tell me that they can't insure the boat until every aspect of the survey has been uh, resolved. And that could be something as simple as it needs a new mast to it needs a new Jubilee clip on a seacock. I'm right in thinking that Every asset is insurable. It just depends on the level of risk. And you would allow a boat to go out as long as Ben hadn't condemned a particular item. Me. Well, Stop if you found, me. no, but if you found something, if you if you turn around to um, the buyer and said, "Don't put to sea at the moment because the propeller is about to fall off," then Paul would be, how would I put it? a fool to insure that boat on day one until that particular item had been resolved. And but. A, a wonky stanchion shouldn't prevent insurance no. being put in place. No. No. But that's, no, 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 that's yeah. back to the that's also back to the surveyor making it clear what's really important, what isn't. 
Yeah. And again, something as serious like a propeller, the surveyor has a duty of care to actually advise you as a broker to tell you not to let the owner take that boat out until it's sorted because that is something that's, you know, while it's a um, confidential report in one sense, we've got to be sensible about what is right and wrong in duty of care to people. But no, it, it, it's got to be proportionate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think from from an insurance perspective, you're absolutely right. If there is something which is fundamental to the to, to the vessel or if if the guy takes it out of the marina and you said in your survey report that the rig is 15, 20 years old, he goes outside the marina or takes it away and the rig falls down and he hasn't done anything about it. Your insurance company is going to look at it and go. You know, maybe you should have done something about that before you left. Equally, would you insure that boat knowing it was a 15 year old rig? In, I if you have, yeah. Or would you put provisos in there and provisions that say, please don't go out in a force eight, please don't go racing, please don't do any. I, but again, I I would, think... if I had 15 year old rigging, I wouldn't pick up the phone and ask you to insure my or pay out on my rig failure. I, I think I think it's a question. That it's still insurable. But the fact of the matter is, if your claim you make then is totally down to the fact the rig fell down or your rigging failed, then you have really not got a leg to stand on. Don't pick up the yeah. phone. And, and and certainly my experience as a surveyor is quite often the the failure of uh, the action of failure isn't covered. What it damages may be covered. So if We're it really lands on someone else's boat, it's quite an interesting one. Really testing my knowledge this evening. This is all good. Yeah, okay, we're going to go made it straight into the Q and A now. So then we'll get. Everyone's got lots of questions for Paul about insurance. Yeah, yeah. Any insurance questions? Pulls your mouth. <laughs> I was I was in marketing for a reason. Okay. Okay. Um, first question coming in is: Are there any specific licenses or permits needed for boat ownership? Who's going to pick that one up, Chris? Um, <laughs> yes, no, and maybe. Um, Fundamentally, if you win the lottery tomorrow, you can walk into my uh, marina and buy pretty much any boat you want to without the need to have any certificates, any proof of capabilities, uh, mm. unless you go over 24 metres, in which case rules and regulations kick in. And equally, if you want to keep it on the inland waterways, I think I'm right in saying that there are requirements on the inland waterways more so than on open water. Yeah. So you don't ask waterways... me the specifics, but... Yeah. I, yeah, I, so I still we, don't I, I still don't think there's a specific qualification you need because we insure people all the time who step on a narrow boat and take it out but i suppose they're traveling at four knots they're not gonna we like to think they won't do too much damage i think that's the issue is that bizarrely that. somebody walks into my office having got lucky on the lotto last night um wants to buy a 50 60 knot capable rib or speed boat never having been on one before there is fundamentally, other than advising them, nothing we can do to stop them buying that boat, launching it and torpedoing themselves at the nearest yacht or whatever it happens to be, the, the East Cows Ferry. I, th I think I think in cases like that where it's a speedboat that does over a certain excessive speed, the insurers may put down that they'd, they'd you, you'd rather have some qualification or have some experience. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm dealing with a client right now who wants to buy a really nice powerboat, but it does 35 knots and he's had no experience or nothing he can actually prove. And then, and they basically put a clause that until he uh, has done a powerboat course, he can't actually physically use it. So, so it, it, it is coming. Uh, on the inland waterways, you've got the uh, boat BSS, boat safety certificate required for the actual physical boat. Uh, so I think boat is... Clauses. You'll only need qualifications if Paul Knox Johnson says you need qualifications. Yeah, that's right. We get a little. Hang on, no, don't put it all on me. <laughs> Wait. Um. Okay. It, on a handover of boat, do you do you as a broker do the handover of the boat, or do you get the owner in? Or so hand and... heart, I try not to, um, for the simple reason that it's not my boat. Um, I don't know what the little red button underneath the chart table does. It might be an injector seat switch for all I know. Um, I don't know if it's a motorboat, whether it performs best at 25 knots or 28 knots. So we will always ask the owner if they're ready, willing and able to do it. It's also nice if everything's gone smoothly for the buyer to meet the seller and the seller to meet the buyer. There's, it's a very emotive thing of owning a boat and people like to know that their boats go into a nice new owner. It's going to be cared for. In the event... 
as happens quite frequently, it's a probate sale. The original owner is no longer with us. It's the kids selling the boat on behalf of dad. Um, then yes, absolutely. A broker, as long as they've got the right qualifications, because whilst we don't need qualifications buying a boat as a commercial entity, I have to have qualifications to take a boat out. We will phone people like Paul up to say, or we'll get the um, the owner of the boat to phone up to say, can the broker take the boat out? More often than not, Paul will say yes, as long as it's not more than three miles offshore, as long as it's with a qualified um, uh, skipper, and that normally means job master or something like that, then yes, we will undertake um, sea trials and handovers. But as I say, it's always better if the owner can be there because it's their boat. They've, they've known it. They know how, how to get the best out of it. Cool. Um, what if I am not happy with the name of the boat and want to change it? Oh, change it. So very quickly, three boats in a marina, all called Apple Blossom. Um, one of them is unregistered. It's called Apple Blossom. You want to change the name, get the heat gun out, peel the stickers off, put another one on there. The boat next to it is called Apple Blossom, but it's also got SSR 12345 on it. So that means it's on the small ships registry. So somebody has taken the time to register themselves as the keeper of that boat with the name Apple Blossom. But it's not unique. The boat next to it, as we've just decided, is already called Apple Blossom. If you then went down this next stage, which is part one registration, what you're basically doing is bagsying that name, but only on the part one registry. You'll see a lot of boats called Apple Blossom of Cows, Apple Blossom of Portsmouth, Apple Blossom of Southampton. In the old days, that was the port of registry. These days, it tends to be because you want your boat to be called Apple Blossom. You fill in a form. Three weeks later, they come back and say, terribly sorry, that name's been taken. So you've got to come up with another name. So the easiest thing to do is go Apple Blossom of somewhere. So it's a bit like racehorses. You call your boat Apple Blossom, but it's registered as Apple Blossom of somewhere else. So simple answer to that question. If it's part one registered, it will cost you a couple of quid to change the name. If it isn't, it's fundamentally peel the stickers off and put another one on there. And good luck coming up with a name for a boat because it's bloody impossible. <laughs> there are so many out there. Um, is there an optimum time of year to buy or sell a boat? Um, That's a good one. Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, option, the optimum time is all the time. Yeah. I mean, no. The, the, so... the funny thing is, you have a cycle, don't you? I mean, I always think if you start at the Southampton Boat Show, lots of people go to the Southampton Boat Show to get ideas, and certainly secondhand, it, it, after the boat show, there's always a little influx of new boat, uh, secondhand boats for sale. So that's always a good time to to start looking because you've got secondhand boats coming on the market. Likewise, you've got people who, who have their boats and they put them up for sale in the winter because they know that come the 1st of January, they might have yard fees or whatever. And they're also looking for the next boat for the spring. So I tend to find that the quietest time, I don't know about yourself, Chris, is normally July and August when everyone's bought everything and what's left is very little choice. Uh, and I go on holiday. <laughs> so, yeah, and Ben's right. So pre well, pre-COVID, everything went in cycles. The spring and the autumn, you saw your peaks for two obvious reasons. Everybody wants to buy their boat and be on the water for Easter. So between January and March, April, we will be very busy people. What we see is that the customers... So there's two points to this, and there's the buyer and a seller. When's the best time to sell a boat? Now, because people want boats for the spring. They've been down to look at a Sigma 33 it sold to a customer that had been looking for six months. He saw it, he bought it. You liked it, you missed out. So you get a bit panicky. You go and have a look at the next boat. And there's this little snowball effect over the next sort of three months of people buying boats. If you're brave as a buyer, buy your boat in July. Because in the middle of July, that owner is hemorrhaging birthing fees left, right and centre. Um, they're paying for this boat that they're not using. And if that boat is available in July you will be able to negotiate much better on that boat because as a broker, hand on heart, I'll be saying to my owner, I'm unlikely to find another buyer now until August, September, October. This guy wants your boat. It's the middle of July. It removes your mooring costs, your running costs. So consider the offer very seriously. If you're a seller, we see most of the listings coming on at two times of the year. End of season, obviously, you've been to Southampton Boat Show, you've seen the Oyster 72, you want to get rid of your little Contessa 32, so you put it up for sale. But as a seller, don't be surprised if it doesn't sell until the springtime. Very few people want to buy boats over the winter because they're not going to use them. Um, again, if you're selling, 
be very focused at this time of year because what will happen is your Contessa 32 that's been up for sale for the last six months then becomes the benchmark for the guy who's about to put his Contessa 32 up for sale. As a broker, I'll be looking around the market and saying, that's one's been up for sale for £35,000 for six months. You want to put yours on the market, you should probably put it on at £33,000 and pip them to the post. So spring and autumn are when we are busiest. But that the right boat will sell at the right time of year. You can sell the right boat in the middle of summer just as easily as you can in the middle of winter. It's all about price, condition, um, and the buyer's um, expectations. Brilliant. Okay. And um, what sort of price would a broker charge to help with a private purchase? Is that Ooh. variable depending on how much yeah. there is? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. The Naomi Campbell thing. I don't get out of bed for less than 10 grand. Um, <laughs> the No, so it, it really just comes down to that boat. If you just want us to do some conveyancing on the paperwork and you're going to go, you literally want me to clarify that we have got five years clear title RCD and VAT, and it's a simple process. We'll have a fee for that. If you want us to get involved in drawing up contracts, the fee is going to go up. It only gets really expensive if we are dealing with international sales because there's just so much more in the way of verification and checks. Putting a number on it, you're going to be spending somewhere between 500 and a thousand pounds for a broker to do um, a decent set of conveyancing for you depending, as I say, on, on on the boat. If it's an old boat that's got very little history, we've got to dig a lot deeper. If it's just us checking a paperwork on a five or 10-year-old boat, it should be quite simple. But sure. happy to do it. That's always good to know. Uh, How many have Stuart, you done, Chris? Stuart, I, think, um, I normally get about five or six a year. And you do those, do you? Yeah, because... End of the day, for me, it's repeat business. If I've helped that customer buy the boat, there's a yeah. good chance that when they come to sell it in three or four years' time, they'll remember me. Yeah. yeah. Um, one for you, Stuart. Is there an age limit for a marine finance for offshore liverboard sailing? As I think age limit of the boat, I think. Wrong <laughs> age limit of the person. I'm uh, 99. I'm going to be dead next week. <laughs> Can I oh. borrow 100 grand? <laughs> <laughs> Offshore and liverboard, that the two things don't go together, do they? Can do, but you will, will, will either, either, either or, I think. Do, do, do we set an age limit on boats? No, we don't. The boat just needs to be seaworthy and it still needs to pass a survey. I think the oldest boat that we financed is 1902. Blimey. And it's still afloat. Was that on the inland or? Yeah, it's um, yeah. a Dutch barge that must have been overplated to death which we don't like oh okay that's still good still still good the last question is for me uh what are the key things that affect the cost of insurance size age value sailing qualifications location and type of mooring well all of them um there's this i mean this is this is where boat insurance is so different to your average car insurance because there are so many different places you can keep them whether you're on a swinging mooring in a marina on the bank side whether you're continuously cruising for the inland waterways there's so many sort of aspects to be taken into account we take in we we, we take in as much information as we need i mean speed of vessel um age of vessel location of mooring type of mooring where the mooring is oh, i've said that um your qualifications your experience all that thing qualification are necessary so if you've got a lot of experience if you've been boating for 25 years but i've only got day skipper that's not going to count against you it's going to be one of those things that we, we it, it's a mixture of facts that you know value obviously <laughs> um what bits of kit you've got on board that you know if you've got twenty five thousand pounds worth of electronics you're probably going to list those as separate items if you've got a 500 pound tender you're going to have that on there as well so there's there's all sorts of aspects which are going to affect the, the premium you pay at the end of the day. Paul, on and that, also... can I jump in? Give for the guys that are considering buying their boats, and let's say the average boat sailboat at the moment that we're selling is about fifty to sixty thousand pounds as an average ballpark figure. You're a you're a, you're an average boater. It's in a marina. It's only going to be used in the UK. It hasn't got anything special on it. It's just a boat. 60 grand boat is going to cost roughly what a year to insure? 
Mm. Blimey. Okay, okay, put him on the spot there. I'd probably be thinking you'd be looking at somewhere. It, I'm going to give you quite a wide ballpark because mm. it, it depends on no claims bonus and things like that. You'd probably be looking anywhere between sort of 350 to 650, something around like that. Yeah. And I think that surprises everybody because if I asked that same person to go and insure a 60 grand car, they'd be paying oh, yeah. three, four times that. Yeah. Insure. Boat, boat insure, boat insurance. insurance. If if you want, if you want, and and again, don't hold me to this one. But if you want to take a rough ballpark, and and you'll probably be over 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 it on most most boats. If you work it out as one percent of the value of the boat, you won't. You'll be over in yeah. in most cases. Yeah, but there are uh, that's a good mind, number to work. One of the things you you haven't touched on is there are quite good discounts for marina use, uh, and also sometimes the marina use. Uh, actually means you don't have an excess on your policy as well. I mean, yeah, that. The, most insurers will do have some sort of marina benefit schemes where if yeah. you're kept, if your boat is kept in a marina, one you get a discount on your premium, and there are aspects of it. If you're if you're if you're damaged while moving about the marina, then there are excess benefits and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, awesome. that's it for questions, everybody. Um, but yeah, I, myself, Chris, and Stuart are all, all going to be up at the Boat Life Show up at the NEC, which is starts, I want to say, next week, uh, next Thursday. Thursday. So, Thursday. so um, I'll be on the Haven Oaks Johnson stand on G151. Stuart will be on the Pro Marine stand, F158, and Chris will be on the Boat Point stand, which is C170. So if you have any questions or just want to come and have a chat with us or even come along and say hello, you enjoyed the webinar or otherwise yeah. then, then do so but obviously also um here are all our contact details if you have any questions with, about anything we spoke about tonight obviously give us a shout we're more than happy to help i would like to personally thank ben chris and Stuart for all their input tonight they've been absolutely amazing to give up their time we've overrun slightly but that's because there was so so much good information and so many good questions out there um so Basically, a huge thank you to them from me. I'm sure they'll be off to go and have a small glass of something to sort of round off their evening. Um, but And also thank you all, everybody who joined us this evening.